today we're going to look at a case report of someone with MS who had a post-Tysabri rebound relapse due to change in health insurance, changing to a lower efficacy disease modifying therapy. And I'm going to read the case report and then we're going to talk about the clinical aspects of it, but also the political aspects. And I invite you to post your own thoughts and experiences and suggestions in the comments below. So I give credit to Dr. Lee and Dr. Chen on this article, and I will reach out to the corresponding author, Dr. Chen, to see if I can get more information on this case and possibly even an interview. So we'll come back to this MRI in a moment. We'll just read the case first. A 24-year-old male with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis stable on natalizumab, that's Tysabri, with no relapses for nearly 10 years, abruptly discontinued Tysabri switching to teraflunamide, which is the pill Abagio, due to loss of insurance coverage. Now to give a little background here, I have a separate video on Tysabri if you wanna take a look. It's a once monthly infusion and the drug works by blocking lymphocytes, a subclass of white blood cells, from getting into the central nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord, and the optic nerve. And so it doesn't kill lymphocytes, it just blocks them from getting in by binding to a protein on the surface of lymphocytes called alpha-4 integrin. The problem with this, even though it's highly effective in preventing lesions on MRI and new relapses, is that if you stop the medication, there can be a rebound effect because those lymphocytes can just rush back into the central nervous system. So it's not recommended to stop the medication suddenly. And I'll talk about more of the details about that after the case. Now, often people give a bridge to another high efficacy medication as an aside, there's good evidence that B cell depleting medications such as Ocrevus and Rituximab are very effective at preventing post Tysabri rebound relapses. Historically, doctors used to recommend a washout sort of allowing Tysabri to clear the system before starting another medication that is no longer recommended because it increases the risk of relapses. So we have refined our practice a little bit. Everyone is afraid of PML, the rare viral infection of the brain caused by the JC virus, which is a known side effect of Tysabri. But in reality, I've never seen a single case of PML in someone with MS taking Tysabri in my entire career. I did have one patient with AIDS get PML. And so in reality, rebound relapses are much more common than PML and people are much less afraid of them. People stop their medication because they're feeling well, people lose health insurance, people get pregnant and can't continue the medication. These things happen in the real world. But let's continue. So two months later, he developed subacute right ataxic hemiparesis, meaning weakness and clumsiness on the right side of the body. Dysarthria, meaning slurred speech, and dysphagia, meaning difficulty swallowing. Requiring admission to the hospital for two weeks, brainstem relapse was confirmed on magnetic resonance imaging figure 1B. So let's look at the images. So A is prior to stopping Tysabri, B is during the relapse, and C is three months after restarting Tysabri. And you can see figure A, by the way, these are all T2 axial flare images, no gadolinium contrast. This is a axial slice of the brain stem through the brain like this, and you can see the axial slice through the ventricles, and you can see that he had lesions typical of multiple sclerosis. During the relapse, he had a new lesion in the right cerebellum and right superior cerebellar peduncle. This explains the right-sided clumsiness. The nerve fibers cross over twice, and that's why you get symptoms on the same side, and this new large lesion in the right periventricular area. And you can see after restarting Tysabri, the lesions improved, though there seems to be a permanent scar in the right periventricular ventricular area, very hard to see the lesion in the right brainstem. Anyway, he remains seronegative for the JC virus. In other words, he was a really good candidate for Tysabri. He was doing well on it since age 14, and he was not really at high risk of PML, risk approximately 1 in 10,000 or less, and yet he stopped it purely for insurance reasons. By the way, I should mention, this story takes place in Canada, in British Columbia, Canada. I don't really know how health insurance works there. I'm in Los Angeles of the United States. So anyways, he was treated with intravenous corticosteroids, a standard treatment for multiple sclerosis relapses, but he apparently didn't get better and he got plasmapheresis. Deficits resolved to pre-cessation baseline with sustained radiologic improvement following resumption of Tysabri. So he got better, which is excellent. 
and they give a little background. So Tysabri is a humanized monoclonal antibody against alpha-4 integrin cell adhesion molecule, which impedes lymphocyte trafficking across the blood-brain barrier, and adalizumab is a high-effect disease-modifying therapy for highly active, aggressive relapsing remaining multiple sclerosis, although long-term use may be limited by cumulative risk of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, that's PML, in patients who are seropositive for JC virus, which he is not. Again, there was really no reason for him to stop Tysabri. It was purely for health insurance reasons. Previous studies have reported return of clinical and radiologic disease activity to pretreatment levels following discontinuation of Tysabri. The risk of rebound upon rapid withdrawal of Tysabri may be as high as 80%, typically occurring within 12 weeks of discontinuation, although often it occurs a little bit later than that, like four months or six months. Rebound may be related to progressive alpha-4 integrin receptor desaturation and immune reconstitution enabling circulating lymphocytes to cross the blood-brain barrier. Again, with medications like Ocrevus, other B-cell depleters, this does not happen because you're actually killing lymphocytes. Numerous bridging strategies for Tysabri discontinuation and transition to an alternative therapeutic agent have been proposed, although consensus on the optimal approach is presently lacking. This is true, although I would say change to a B-cell depleter, no washout, is probably the best strategy for most people. Cessation of natalizumab mandates appropriate therapeutic bridging and vigilant monitoring owing to substantial risk of withdrawal-related rebound and attendant neurological sequelae. Definitely true. So I'll make a few comments. So first, we can talk about sort of the clinical aspect of this case, then the political aspect of this case. So the clinical aspect is, you know, why did they change from Tysabri to Abagio? That wasn't really a good decision. I have a separate video on Abagio if you want to take a look. It's much lower in efficacy uh, than Tysabri. There's no evidence that it's effective for prevention of rebound relapses. It probably was not the best choice in this individual who previously was sick enough to require Tysabri. We don't know exactly what happened to him at age 14. We don't exactly know why he lost health insurance either. So in the United States, I see things like uh, someone becomes pregnant, as I said, or someone moves to a new location and they can't get a new doctor fast enough, or someone is working and they have health insurance, but their employer changes providers, and maybe the new provider, the new health insurance, doesn't cover a particular drug. Or in the United States, you can get health insurance through your parents if they have health insurance through their employer up through the end of age 25. And so I see some age 26 victims. In other words, people turn 26 and they lose health insurance. And of course, even if you're unemployed, there are other ways to get health insurance, like through Medicaid or Medicare if you're disabled, for example. But you know, you may not get the same provider. You may not get them quick enough. You may not get coverage for the same drug. You know, I see people who get insurance through the Affordable Care Act. They may have significant co-insurances for clinically administered drugs, and it may be unaffordable to them, even if they were getting it for free beforehand, for instance. And of course, you can get help from the pharmaceutical companies, but it just gets very complicated and difficult to do, particularly when you're a sick person. So to go back to the clinical case for a moment, potentially this could have been avoided by the doctors. And I'm not trying to criticize doctors. I don't know anything about Canadian health care. I don't know what their options were. But one option would be to change to another medication. And I posted this case on Twitter and some people said, hey, isn't ret I got cut off at the end of the video because I ran out of hard drive space, but let's try again. So people would say that, wait a minute, isn't rituximab actually cheaper than Abagio in most circumstances? So why would he get coverage for Abagio, but not rituximab, which is actually more effective at preventing post-Tysabri relapses? And the irrationality compounds because isn't the cost of Abagio fairly similar to Tysabri? So why would he be forced to change to a less effective medication? medication on which he was doing well to a less effective but equally expensive medication. And furthermore, if they're so thrifty, why are they covering Abagio in general? Abagio is essentially identical to the old rheumatoid arthritis medication Arava, as I discussed in a prior video. So it's just irrationality compounded on irrationality. Now, of course, there's no perfect system. In the United States, a lot of people would think that the Canadian system is better. After all, they have a longer life expectancy than the United States. They have much lower cost of health care. But as you can see from this article, it's far from perfect. 
And you might also say in the United Kingdom, the nationalized health service is the way to go, but they have their own problems. For example, many years ago, MS blogger Professor Gavin Giovannoni from Barts in London posted that it was very difficult to get Thai Sabri. The criteria at the time were that you had to have two disabling relapses while taking another disease-modifying therapy. And so, in other words, he would have had, the person in this article, had to have relapses twice, significant relapses, prior to even getting access to Tysabri. So he may have been no better off. Of course, there's no perfect system. But I'd be interested to know your thoughts. Do you live in the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, something else? What is your interaction with the healthcare insurance system where you live and how has it affected your MS? And what have been the cost to you as well? And do you have any suggestions to make it better? And do you have any suggestions for future videos?